So I'm just going to sort of go in order here, more or less. Okay, so let's just start off uh, with section 1.1. Here are some things that you should know. And when I say know, what I mean is you should just be able to define these. If I ask you what any of these are, you should just be able to tell me. That's what I mean. Okay, first is the, what's called the well-ordering property, right? Okay, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and remind you what these are. These, if you've been coming to class, and most of you have, these are all in your notes and, of course, in the book. The well-ordering property for the natural numbers just says that every non-empty subset of the natural numbers has a least element. So if you were to say that, that's exactly it. That you get full credit for that if I asked you that. Okay, every non-empty subset, non-empty is important. If it's empty, it can't have a least element because it doesn't have any elements at all. So these are the things I expect you to, to pay attention to the details. Right, because they're really, I'm kind of throwing you a bone here. I mean, I'm, already t I'm telling you all the kinds of things I could be asking you. All you have to do is remember it. That's it. Okay. Um, the second is the. So yeah. Uh huh. The second part to that says that so I can take an A and as such that A is less than all B's. Mm hmm Oh, well, no, I mean, you can write it out. You, you, can, you can say it in words or you can write it out specifically. I mean, so what he's saying is you can say um, the well-ordering property like this. So let S be a non-empty subset of the natural numbers. Then there exists some X in S such that X is less than or equal to Y for all Y in S. Or you can just say that every non-empty subset of the natural numbers has the least element. I, don't, I really don't care. I just want you to know what it is. So that's fine. No, it, it doesn't. I mean, in this context, the way I stated it is it, it, it did. But the same thing is true as long as you take, I mean, if you look at the integers, of course, it's not true for the integers. Because if you look at the integers themselves, the integers themselves is, constitutes a non-empty subset of itself. And there's certainly no least integer, right? You can always go down. But as long as you're taking just whatever your set of integers is, as long as it's sort of what's said to be sort of bounded from below, as long as you're only taking sort of a segment of the negative part, and you can just go all the way up to infinity, then that same principle is going to hold. Okay? But I don't expect, I mean, I'm not going to ask you that in general. It's just going to be applied to the natural numbers. First principle of finite induction. Okay, and I, I want to be clear on this, on these two points too. The way I've written the notes, at least if, if memory serves here, the first principle of finite induction has, is not, I'm not talking about any properties per se. I mean, you, you sort of employ this principle when you're working on specific problems. The first principle of finite induction just says that if you take uh, S to be a subset of the natural numbers that satisfies 1 is an S and 2 for all natural numbers n, if n is an S, then n plus 1 is an S, the conclusion is that S is equal to all the natural numbers, the set of all natural numbers. Okay, so this has nothing to do with P of n and don't, you shouldn't be writing P of n. It's just, it, it, it's a very specific statement about um, if you know a subset has these two properties, then you know that it has to be everything. That's what the first principle says. Okay, and that should have, I'm sure that was the case when I wrote it in, I mean, I'll, I'll look back at the notes, but I, I'm sure that's what I said in class too. Okay. Okay, sorry, I'm going to be a little lazy here. The second principle, oops, left off the D, sorry. I got really lazy. There we go. Second principle of finite induction. And so you remember that this, this says that, okay, you, you strengthen the hypothesis. And so the second principle of finite induction says that if you have a subset of the natural numbers that satisfies S, say, 1 is an S, and for every natural number n, if you know that 1 through n, are, those are all an S, then n plus 1 is an S then the conclusion is the same, that S equals N. That's the second principle of finite induction, according to the book, which remember I called strong induction, right? Okay, I will, I mean, if this comes up on the exam, I'll probably state, but you know, if I ask you this, I'll probably say, state the second principle of finite induction, AKA strong induction, so that there's no confusion. You'll see both of them. Okay, so let's, what I want to do now, and, and this of course has come up in other sections too, is, is I want to um, go ahead and do a proof 
um, using induction. And I, I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to kind of do this a little bit overkill on purpose, just because I want you to see the structure of a of an argument that flows in the right direction. Some of you guys are going the wrong direction, and I'm, um, like I said, I'm I'm kind of doing this on purpose to try to make this point. So let me let me do this. This is actually one of your homework problems that you, you did, that uh, wasn't graded. Um, bless you. Okay, and it was this one. Prove that 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus on down to 1 over n squared, e uh, sorry, is less than or equal to 2 minus 1 over n. for all natural numbers n. Okay. <clears throat> so we are uh, we're going to use induction, the first principle of, of finite induction because of time I'm I'm, gonna, I'm not going to write that out, but um, there are two things that you need to do. You need to establish the base case, and then you have to do the inductive step. Okay, so okay, so I'm going to I'm going to offset these just because I, I want this to be very clear what the separation is. Base case. Some of you are expending too much effort on the base case. Okay. What I would like you to do, just for clarity, this is a nitpicky comment, but the, the base case here, so this is an assertion that's being made for all natural numbers n. The base case of the assertion is what, what happens when n is equal to 1. It's the specific statement with, with n being 1. And so what's the assertion? What's the left-hand side of the inequality? Well, if n is 1, there's nothing, we're not, going any, we're not going anywhere. We're ending where we start, right? So it's just 1 over 1 squared is less than or equal to 2 minus 1 over 1. That's exactly what the statement is, right? Now here's where things get a little bit murky maybe because you, you might say, well, I don't know what you want me to, to prove. This is the base case. Here's, okay, you are all in this class, you certainly have enough sophistication to look at this and say, oh, the left side is one, the right side is one. You don't have to spell it out, you really don't. You don't have to say left side is equal to one over one squared versus one, right side is two minus one over one, one over one equals one, therefore two minus one over one is two minus one, which a lot of you are doing that kind of stuff. Um, I, something like this that I, that I would expect a fourth grader to see immediately is you do not have to justify. I'm not saying it's wrong if you do it. And I know some of you don't know. Maybe you think I'll take off points if you don't do it. I'm not blaming you for it. I'm just letting you know. This is obvious. You don't have to say anything else. You should write it out because it is important that you know that it's true, that you, you check the box. But that's all you have to do here is just state what the, what the base case is and then just, if it's obvious, that's, it's fine. Yes? Yeah, it is. So, mm -hmm. like, when I say check mark and then tell me prove a formal, then what am I supposed to say for like a base case? Just no, but what I'm expecting is that you would write it like you would an English paper. Don't write check marks and and booyah and that kind of stuff. <laughs> no, some, some a couple of people did that. Um, that's all I'm saying is write it out like you wouldn't put a check mark in a, in an English paper. That's all I'm saying. Okay, for you know, obvious is is subjective, right? But but. You know, and so formal is subjective too, to a degree. But um, it, this is not a big deal. I actually didn't take off points for that specific thing. But, but yeah, I mean, write it, write it like you would. I mean, so for example, in the book, you're not going to see that. You're not going to see oh check mark. That's not in the book. So what I mean is write it as if you're presenting it formally. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Um, now, yeah. Huh? 
Yeah. Oh, oh, over here. I thought. Sorry, I thought you did. Okay. How often do you have to repeat textual information like n is an element of n? Um, well, okay. I, I'll I'll try to address that here in a second. Okay. I have a question too. Yeah. Uh, do you mean the right was clearly true after the right has clearly true statement? Uh, um, yeah, you should. Well, you should finish. I mean, it should at least be a sentence, uh, and and it should be. Yeah, I would. I would. Um, I would like you to write that. It just it just kind of gives it a nice flow, you know. I mean, if you just say we must check that this, but you didn't check that this, you didn't say anything. You just say we must check it, and then you move on. Like, it's not, you know. Right. Yeah, I mean, the base case is really just, though it's is an assertion. I, I mean you. It would be better just to say that it's true, just so it doesn't leave the, the reader wondering. Oh, is he just saying the proposition, or is he, does he actually going to nip it in the button and tell me that it's actually correct? It's just better to do it, because it only takes a few words. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is a nitpicky. Just be, this is very, I'm being very nitpicky right now, but I'm just kind of letting you guys know kind of what. Well, yeah, I know, I know. That's true. But I'm just kind of letting you know where, where I kind of want you guys to, to go. Um, so the inductive step. Okay, here's where there, there are some, some issues. Okay, I'm, in fact, because of time, I may, not, I may not go through the entire proof, but I'm at least going to get this, this started. This, I want, you, I want you guys to listen to this. As some of you are, are doing this. Um, when you're doing induction, the inductive step is, is, uh, consists of two parts. The first part, and a lot of you are missing this, is to state your inductive hypothesis. If you don't do that again, it's just it's not clear to the reader. It's clear again. I know what the, how this works, but if you don't if you leave out the inductive hypothesis, then your reader is going, wh where is this coming from? Where where is this coming? It should all be tied together neatly so that there's no question where you're you're pulling stuff out of. The inductive step consists of assume for some natural number n that that holds. That should be in your proof. We must prove, and you don't necessarily have to write this, although it's nice for yourself and for me, so I know where you're going. We must prove that. That's true with n being replaced with n plus 1. Okay? But stating your inductive hypothesis is an essential component of the proof. Okay? If you don't do it, you're, you're leaving things out. Then you're pulling things out of hats that you've never introduced before. Okay? So you, you really have to write that out. And some of you are not doing that. Write out the inductive hypothesis very, very clearly. And it's, the inductive hypothesis is always just let n be a natural number or let n, n be arbitrary or whatnot. And it's just, it's just what you're trying to prove. That's it. That's all the inductive hypothesis is. Yes? No, no, but you're not assuming it holds for all n. That's assuming what you want to prove. You're assuming that it holds for some n, and then you want to prove that it's true for n plus one. You would never assume what you're trying to prove. You're just assuming that it's it's true for some n. What you're trying to establish is this. The second part of the induction principle is a conditional statement. It's if it's true for n, then it's true for n plus one. So to prove a conditional statement directly, you might remember this from discrete. You assume it, that it's true for n, and then you show that it's true for n plus 1. But you definitely do not assume it's true for all n. No, you're assuming that there exists, that n, that n is arbitrary, and, it's, and it is true for that n. You want to prove it's true for the next one. If you assume it's true for all n, then you don't need to show it's true for n plus 1, because you've, you've already assumed it's true for everything. Okay. Right? But then if I just, if I drop it and say, can we assume whatever replacement, No, just, just say something like this. I mean, this is all you have to do. So assume for some n and n that, okay, and let me, let me make this clear. I could have done this above, but uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you guys are asking these questions. Um, and now I'm probably not going to have time to go through the whole thing in detail. <coughs> so assume that one over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared all the way down to 1 over n squared is less than or equal to 2 minus 1 over n. Okay. Everybody clear on this? Okay, this is the inductive hypothesis. All right, and... See, let me know when I can. If anyone's still writing, I'll, I'll, of course I want you to get this down here. Are 
Are we okay? Okay, I see a couple of people. Are you, guys, are you both of you okay? I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some leeway because you made me some sweet donuts. Um, are, are you okay? Are, have you got this mostly down now? Are you are you you good? Okay, all right. Okay, you know. Okay, well, I wasn't sure. I was thinking, maybe you're you know thinking about baking me more donuts and stuff, and you're not paying attention. That's fine with me. Well, you can't read my mind. What can I say? Um, okay, <laughs> so. There was the inductive hypothesis, right? So now what do we have to do? So we have to prove this. And it's, it's just nice for the benefit of your reader to write down what it is you're going to prove before you do it, just so that whoever's reading it can see what your goal is. Okay, and yeah, I, I'd hope to go through all this in detail, but I just don't think I'm going to have time. Okay, so we have to prove that 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared all the way down to 1 over n squared plus 1 over n plus 1 squared is less than or equal to 2 minus 1 over n plus 1. And so this is, again, just what we get by replacing the n in the inductive hypothesis with n plus 1. And we have to establish this. And so remember, the whole point of induction is that, is that inductive hypothesis, that's in your hands. You can use it as if it were fact. And you use it to extract this out somehow. That's the whole idea. Um, the other thing I want to say, and I did an example of this before, and some of you are still doing this. Um, overall, I'm, I'm actually pretty happy with your work, just in case I seem like I'm really angry all the time. I'm not, really. Um, I'm pretty happy overall with, with your work. Most of you really seem like you have a, at least a good handle on the mathematics of what's going on. Um, don't start with what you want to prove. That's very important. And I, I know I did the silly example before, but some of you are just assuming that it's true, and then you just want to keep fiddling with it until you get something like 20 equals 20. And then you say, ah, now it works. Well, maybe. But then reverse, your proof should go in the opposite order. You start with what you know and you get to what you want to prove. You do not start with what you want to prove. You'd never do that, okay? That's just not a proper argument. You start with what you know and you ex then you follow an argument until you get to where you need to go, okay? So, so for those of you that are still doing that, don't stop doing that. Try to stop doing it. And a lot of you, all you have to do is reverse your arguments. All you have to do is just take your proof and go like this, okay? But it's just not proper flow to, to do it this way. Um, Yes. Um, so for, for some of you, that's what, what's happening here. So um, what you want to do is, and this is, unfortunately, I'm going to not have time to go through this, but... So you're not going to start from this. What, what do you mean? You're not going to... Oh, no, 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 I'm not. So I'm gonna t I'll tell you what, yeah. I'm, okay. If you go back up here to the inductive step, okay? So most of you, when you're doing your proofs, mo most of you this applies to, um, you should be, you know, doing some stuff on scratch work first until you can see how everything fits together and then construct your proof. It's not, again, it's not like, you know, calculus where you want to find the slope of the tangent line to y equals e to the x plus 1 at 0, 2. It's not like that. You can just start right away because you know what you're doing. Ugh, plug this in, plug and chug, you know. Some of these problems are not going to be that way. Sometimes you're going to start and you're going to go, oh, well, now I'm going to need this fact in the middle of my proof that I didn't know I was going to need. So... Let me prove that first, and then I'll refer to it later. The flow is much, much better than when you say, uh, digre digression. Here's another digression. You know, state those things first, and then state your argument. It just flows much better that way. Yes? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, on the exam, you know, um, well, first of all, um, I'm going to, to give you scratch paper for the exam. Second of all, the, the problems are not going to be impossibly difficult on the exam either. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't think that's going to be a major issue on the test. It's a good question, but I don't think it's going to be a problem. Okay. Well, I mean, you've got several sections, and so, I mean, the first, the first section is induction. And of course, as you know from doing the homework, there are later sections where induction also comes up. You will almost certainly see some induction problem on the test. That is, I can tell you right now, you will. You will definitely see that. Okay. 
So you should sort of know how to, how to proceed with constructing these things. Um, so let me just say that, and I wish again I could go through this, but what do we do? What's the idea? The idea is you don't start here. This is where you want to get. Okay, and this, this is the main point I wanted to make anyways. You want to start with this. Okay, or what you can say is, okay, there's, there are a couple things you could do. You say we want to prove that this is less than or equal to 2 minus 1 over n plus 1. So what you could do, of course, is say by the inductive hypothesis, the left-hand side, okay, is less than or equal to 2 minus 1 over n plus 1 over n plus 1 squared, right? Okay, so I mean, the more natural way to do this is just to say, okay, let's just start with the inductive hypothesis. What do we do? We want to get this, right? So let's add 1 over n plus 1 squared to both sides. We can certainly add anything we want to an inequality. We have the same thing to both sides. So then we have exactly what we want up here. We have the left-hand side up here now. So then what do, we, what do we want to do? We just want to show that 2 minus 1 over n plus 1 over n plus 1 squared, right? That's what we added to both sides so that we could get this, is less than or equal to that. And the rest of your proof should just be, expend, it should be trying to prove that 2 minus 1 over n plus 1 over uh, n plus 1 squared is less than or equal to 2 minus 1 over n plus 1. And that's, that's how you would finish off the proof. So the main point again, start with your inductive hypothesis. Don't, don't start with what you want to prove. You end with what you want to prove. That's how an argument flows. Okay? Okay, I'm sorry that this is incomplete. If I had more time, I would do the whole thing. But I just don't, unfortunately. And I think you'd probably rather me go on to more stuff so you know what to be studying for the exam. So I'm going to just, I, ha I just don't have a choice but to stop at this point. Um, okay. So... The next section is 1.2. This is the binomial theorem. And I can tell you there are not many things you need to know here. And, and that's, in fact, I mean, as far as the definitions and the theorems, there's very little. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yes? I was just thinking about complete sentences. When the, when step, n is some equality, mm -hmm. and step n plus 1 is algebraically equivalent to it, like you're just showing your work, mm -hmm. right. um, should I try and make that into a sentence, or can I say, you know, sentence, 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 here, and then... Just yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. So you're, you're talking about, you know, you've got an equation, you're just going to do some basic algebra or something. Um, you should tell me what it is that you're, do, you're doing. Okay, so you know if you're going to cancel something out and then take reciprocals and then do this, don't put all that in one step. You should say you should say what it is that you're doing. Um, you know, you could put it even parenthetically. You know, if you want off to the side, that's fine. But and some of you got got docked a few points for there was uh, I think this you know, n choose k business. There were there was something um, where r was one half n times n minus one or something like that. And some of you lost some points because you just weren't clear how you got where, where you you know you were getting your next step from. And again, it's not that I don't think you know. It's for the same reason that you should be clear in, in, in what, you're, what you're saying. Okay? Especially, especially, for example, some of you did this. Some of you did this, and you have this in your homework. You just started canceling things out, and you used the fact that um, r plus 1 factorial is r factorial times r plus 1, but you never stated it. You just sort of, in your mind, you had it, and then you canceled everything out, and then all of a sudden you get to this really simple equation. Those are things you should definitely state. You should state in your argument. Okay? Now, again, for the benefit of your grandma. Okay? Not me. Not me. You have to remember that this is what you're doing. Um, no, I'm, I'm serious. I know, I know you're giving me a weird look here. But this is, this is the point. The point is you are writing an argument to convince someone who doesn't already have all the steps in their head. That is the point of this. That's just not for me. That's every mathematician. That's what we do. Okay? That is, that's it's part of the game. Okay? Um, so what do, we, what do we need to know here? Um, one, know the definition of and choose k, right? You should know when it's defined, right? This is not defined for n equals minus 50, for example. This is not defined for n equals 5 and k equals 50 either, right? You should know what the, you know, if I could say, what, what you know, what, what are the restrictions on n and k here? Well, what, what is it? Well, n has to be an integer that's bigger than or equal to 0, and k has to satisfy 0 is less than or equal to k, which is less than or equal to n. Okay, you should know that. It doesn't, we haven't defined 2 choose 7. We haven't talked about that. Right? Second thing, and you might be able to guess what the, there's just two more here. You might be able to guess what these things are. The second is binomial theorem. 
You should know what that is. And you shouldn't just know what it is, you should know how to work with it too. I mean, I could say, okay, what is, um, without multiplying all this out, and I will look at your scratch paper to see if you're doing it, what's a plus b to the fifth? Use a binomial theorem. Instead of a plus b times a plus b, foil, then foil, then foil, then foil. Okay? So I mean, I could ask you something like that just to make sure you actually know how to use it. Because like I said, a five-year-old can memorize the symbols. You, you st I do expect that you can, can work with it too. Okay? Um, let's see. Oops. And then the third thing you should know is Pascal's rule. And of course, that, that came up in one of your homework, actually one of the graded problems, uh, Pascal's rule came up. Uh, mo most of you saw that. You, you saw how to apply it the correct way, but that's something you should know. Okay. And so this, I'm not, for now anyways, I'm, I'm not going to say anything about this as far as, as, as specific problems are concerned, but um, you should certainly be able to work with these, these things. I mean, I, I could certainly ask you a proof that involves the binomial theorem, not in a really messy, nasty, complicated way, but um, you had a couple of homework problems that involved the binomial theorem. Certainly one, I think it was 2a or something like that, where all you had to do was let a and b be one, and you've got everything to work, maybe it's 3a, but you got everything to work out you know, without a, hardly, with hardly any work whatsoever. Um, but you should definitely be familiar with how to use the binomial theorem within a proof of some sort. Okay, um, so what about section 2.2? Not a whole lot to this section. Um, you should know the division algorithm. Actually, that's really all we did in this section. Okay, and so the division algorithm does, I mean, there are several parts to it, and you know, if I ask this, uh, if I ask you this, the question, what does the division algorithm say? Um, you should say everything very clearly, okay? So, this has something to do with dividing by, by n. Okay, so if you take an integer a, so really the statement is, I'm, I may be using different letters here, but um, for any integer a and for any natural number n, in other words, any positive integer n, there exists unique integers q and r such that one, a equals nq plus r, and two, r satisfies zero is less than or equal to r, which is less than n. There are a lot of po points here, but I, I expect you to get all of those. Okay, it's not just we can divide and get a remainder. You will get zero points if you say that. Okay, it's a very specific, very clear, rigorous mathematical statement. And I do expect you to state it as such, as I did in class. Unique is important too. That's part of the, that's part of the, um, the division algorithm. Okay. All right. So what I want to do, I think this is probably the best way to proceed. It's just to tell you the things that you need to be looking over. And then whatever time we have left, we can go back and spend on problems. Okay. Well, fortunately, we only have one more section to talk about. Let's see. Okay, 2.3. All right, so let me just try to squeeze all this from in from left to right. Several things that we talked about in 2.3. You should know the the definition of factor. Right? Okay, and, and when I say this, of course, I don't mean factoring a, a, a binomial. That's not what I mean. I mean, know what it means for an integer a to be a factor of an integer b, right? Or there are lots of other synonyms for this that I'm not going to write down, right? A divides B, right? B is a multiple of A, all of these things. You should know what these are. Okay, so, and I'm going to be very clear about this part. So you should also know the definition of GCD.
Okay, and so there's one part here that, given the notes that I gave you, you might have a question about. I gave you, unlike the book, I, I actually proved a theorem first, showing that the GCD existed and was unique, even though I didn't call it the GCD in the theorem, and then I defined the GCD after we had the theorem. So what do I mean by, by GCD? Well, um, the GCD of two integers a and b, remember the assumption is that a and b can't both be zero, otherwise there is no greatest common divisor because everything divides zero. Um, it's a positive integer d with the property that d divides a and d divides b, and if c is an any integer that divides both a and b, then c divides d. That is the definition of GCD. There's this other part, right, where it's a linear combination of a and b, okay? That, I mean, of course, if you say it, I'm not going to take off any points if I ask that on the test, but that's not really part of the definition of GCD, okay? We had just done it, so I, I, I mentioned it, but, but the definition it has nothing to do with the linear combination part. It's just what I said before. You guys okay with, with this? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, you should know, I don't expect you, of course, to cite theorem numbers, but whatever, you know, if, if we proved a theorem that you need, you could just state what the result is without saying, by theorem, you know, two from this date, I don't expect that, but you may need to, to know these, which I did prove for you. Um, I'm going to abbreviate this a little bit, but uh, the GCD of A and B is equal to 1. if and only if xa plus yb equals 1. Okay, now here's a, a good point, a uh, place for me to illustrate a point I was trying to make before. I'm not done writing this yet. This right here is, of course, I, <laughs> I realized I was lazy over here and I didn't say that a and b were integers that weren't both zero, but just suppose I did. Um, Formally, this is not what you would say, because someone reading this would say, what's x and what's y? Is it my cat? Is it an integer? Is it the square root of 2? What is it? For some integers, x and y. That's how you complete this. Never introduce, when you're defining or in your proof, never introduce a pronoun that you haven't defined. Okay? Don't do that. So in that case, we would say, for all a and b that are integers, blah, 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 for some Um, no, if, if I wrote this out in general, it would just be this. It would just be, let a and b be integers which are not both zero. Then the GCD of a and b is one if and only if x a plus y b equals one for some integers x and y, or for some x and y and z. Okay, it's not the case that, the, that it's true for every integer a and b. Certainly not. Two and four, for example. You can't write a linear combination of two and four to, to give you one. Um, but we're just saying it is one if and only if this property holds. Yes? That's fine. You can do that. The upside down A and the backward Z for exists. Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Not much. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, I, I would prefer not not to use modular arithmetic. Yeah, we we that that the the problem with that is just that those of you that know about this stuff and know some of the tricks, if I let you use that, then the other students are at a disadvantage who haven't seen it yet. No, that's awesome for us. I know it. <laughs> yeah, but it's not so good for the other people. So, you 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 know. Generally speaking, your argument should be constructed. What you're using should be a subset of what we've done in the class and what the book has done so far. Okay? All right. So let's see here. And I, I may even, if I don't ask you all these, but one of these, these uh, you know, um, theorems comes up in the course of a proof that I give you, I may say, hint, use this fact in your proof. Okay? But these are things that you should be comfortable with at the very least. All right? I'm certainly not going to say what was theorem three from two point. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. Okay, and, and just because I'm running out of space here, um, I'm not going to write everything out formally. But if A divides C and B divides C, and the GCD of A and B is one. Then, a d uh, sorry a b divides c. Right? We talked about this. I proved this for you. Okay. 
Can you guys see this? Okay. All right. And um, just so I, I can kind of move on here, I, sorry for this being very sloppy, but I, there's one more that I want to say, and I'm just going to write it up here. So this goes in with all this stuff too. If A divides BC and the GCD of A and B is 1, in other words, A and B are relatively prime, then A divides C. This is one where I, uh, this is called Euclid's lemma, I believe, and I just said, okay, the proof is very similar to the previous. I didn't actually prove this, but it's. Uh, uh, well, I mean, it all depends on what you mean by, by opposite, but I mean, the ideas behind why this works, they are these, they're the same. They're basically the same. Yeah. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do now. Wait till you got, got this down. Um, let me do, I think I'm going to do one of, your, um, one of your homework problems in this section. Um, 2.3 really, <coughs> the problems work out very, very nicely, really. Um, they, there's not a lot of trickery involved in this section. Um, for a lot of them, it's just, you know, you just brute force, you expand out with the algebra, and it just falls out right away. Um, so this, this problem I'm going to do is, there's really not much to it either, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm doing it just because, again, I want you to see. Now I'm going to do an entire proof here. You can see what it is that I'm expecting as far as how to write the argument out and such. And some of you are still struggling a little bit with this. So I want to at least get one whole proof in today. What's that? Let me see. Okay, yeah, let me say something about that. Um, I should have given you both. I just felt bad because I'd already given you 10 problems and I just decided not to, although I should have. Um, no, uh, I'm not going to do that. Here's what you can do. Okay, first of all, 21B in 2.3 um, says to, to, to prove that 2 to the 35th minus 1 is divisible by 31 and 127. You can use part A to do that in about one line. Now, some of you probably, in fact, most of you probably didn't realize this, but this hint is actually directly a result of a problem that you've already done back in, in section 1.1. And that is, this hint, and this is, this is also partly why I didn't, I didn't assign it. Um, if you go back to, if you have your book open, if you're, you're curious, or if you have your homework, this is just problem two. This is a special case of problem two in 1.1. That's what the hint is. So if you want it, so there's nearly no point in you proving the hint in a sense because you've already done it before. So we can and cannot You can assume part A. Yes, you can. So you do not need to, to prove part A. And I was, I'm glad that you brought that up because I intended to make a, that comment about this problem anyways. Part B, you can just use part A, and then it, if you see what to do, it's super, super easy. Okay? I don't expect you to prove part A. Now, if you do it, I'm not going to slash points because you did it more work, but you don't have to do it. And I, I'm just telling everyone, you did Part A already in your first assignment, except actually a more general version of Part A in number two and one one. Okay. So that's why I also felt a little better. What's that? What? Uh, what is your number three say? Your number three says use the second principle of finite induction to establish blah 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 blah. Oh well, I mean. It really, uh, it really doesn't matter, honestly. I think you can make them both work. Um, but yeah, um, I, I said number two just because I assigned number two. I didn't assign number three. So um, that's why I'm saying you've, you've, you've done it before, because it, it was, it's essentially number two. OK. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that you should know. And what I'm going to do is um, let's take a look at, if I can find my notes here. Let's take a look at number 20B. 
Okay, so everyone have, I assume I was yammering for a while. Everybody's got this down now? Okay. All right, so again, this is 2.3, and we'll have plenty of time to finish this, this up. 20B. And it just says this. If the GCD of A and B is equal to 1, and C divides A, then the GCD of B and C is also equal to 1. Okay, so there are a couple of ways that you could do this, actually. And in fact, because we have the time and I, I want you to get used to thinking different ways, I'm going to present both of these arguments. Um, so intuitive, we haven't really talked, we haven't, of course, talked at all about factorization yet, but the idea here is that think of the, okay, the GCD of A and B being one, just to give you some intuition. What this really means is, of course, A and B, one of, they could be negative here, but roughly you think of it this way. Think of writing the prime factorizations out. There's no prime in common to both. That, that's intuitively kind of what's going on here, okay? So suppose C is a factor of A. Well, what's the prime factorization of C going to look like? Well, it's going to have primes that are appearing in the prime factorization of A because it's a factor of A, okay? So the GCD of B and C then also has to be one because the prime factors in C are amongst the prime factors in A, okay? And they can't, there's nothing in common between A and B. So intuitively, that's kind of why this is going to work this way. It's not really that mysterious once you think of it like this. But of course, we don't, we're not going to appeal to that because we haven't talked about that yet. We will, but we haven't gone into that yet. So what you can do is just use the basic stuff that you've, you've done already and the theorems in this section, and it falls out pretty easily. Okay, so... Here's the idea. Okay. So we're going to assume that A and B Are integers. I'm writing everything out here, which are not both zero. Sorry to keep asking. Yeah, that's that's fine. Uh, we assume that when you look at, uh, uh huh. Is that next? No, okay. no. It's sort of implied by this GCD notation. If, 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 otherwise, this wouldn't even have any meaning. I'm doing it, though, just to reinforce this, especially considering the test is coming up on Thursday so everybody understands this. So there are two things that we're assuming here. The GCD of A and B is 1, and the second is that C divides A. For some integer c. I'm going to ask you a question that probably none of you would even think to, to ask yourselves, but if you're going to be completely rigorous here, this is a question that you should be able to answer. Okay. Uh, of course, I'm, and I'm glad that you asked that. 
the GCD is only defined for integers that are not both zero. We've talked about that before. But notice then that the conclusion is that the GCD of B C and C is one. So if this have any meaning, we should know that B and C aren't, aren't both zero, right? How do we know that B and C can't both be zero? Well, okay, I want, I'm, okay, I'm going to waste about two minutes until someone tells me. Why, why can't B and C both be zero? No, 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 no. No, what I'm saying is we, we need to prove that the GCD of B and C is one. So in particular, it has to be well-defined. So in particular, B and C can't both be zero. How do we know that? Well, no, 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 but it's not, no, 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 it's not by definition of GCD because we're trying to prove something. So there are two things. We need to show that, one, we need to know it exists, and two, we need to know that it's equal to one. Okay, well, see, what, hang on a second. So you're on the right, you're on the right track, okay? But A could be zero. You could have zero and one, right? The GCD of zero and one is one. There's no, there's no contradiction there yet. No, 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 no. <laughs> zero only divides one thing, zero. Zero times x equals something. That thing has to be zero. Here's why. Okay, I, I lied. I guess I'm just going to tell you now. But the reason why b and c can't both be zero is, is because of this. Suppose b and c, but try to follow this. Suppose b and c were both zero. b and c were both zero. So c is zero. c divides a, so a has to be zero. But then b and a are both zero, right? Because we're assuming b and c are both zero. If b and c are both zero, then because c divides a and c is zero, a is zero. But then b and a are zero, contradiction because it, it contradicts the definition of GCD, which we're assuming in the beginning of the problem. OK? Probably none of you would stop to, to cross that, that i. But that, I'm not going to write that down. But that, that technically is part, of the, is part of the argument. It is. If you think it's not, you're wrong. It, it really is. If you wanted to dot, it'd be completely rigorous. That's something you'd have to check. For sure. OK. Um, I'm not going to do it. And I'm not going to take off points if you, if you didn't do it either. But just for the sake of being thorough. Um, OK, so what do we know? OK, I'm, I'm just kind of going from memory here. And somebody can tell me if I've got this label wrong. but. I believe that theorem two was the theorem uh, about the GCD where I, I proved the existence and uniqueness of this D that satisfied all these conditions. <laughs> theorem one, I think, was that divisibility uh, result. Maybe someone can verify this. Theorem two about there exists a unique integer D such that D divides A, D divides B, blah, 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 all that stuff. Theorem two in this section, in your notes? No, 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 I, I don't mean the book is labeling it theorem two. I mean, the, in the notes, it's labeled as theorem two. Okay, you, okay. I just wanted to make sure. And C divides A and B, C divides D, and then therefore, you know, and also D is a linear combination, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yep. Okay. So what do we know? We know that XA plus YB equals 1. For some integers x and y, right? And I want you to pause for a second to make sure that you're you're clear on this point. One is that the GCD of a and b is one. Theorem two says though that the GCD is always a linear combination. So since one's the GCD, it's a, it's an integer linear combination of a and b. That's from theorem two. You guys with me so far? Okay. Now, since, what else do we need to use? Well, the fact that C divides A, what does that mean? It means that C times Z equals A for some integer Z, right? Small Z, big Z. Should have made the big Z bigger, but. OK. And again, just for, just for clarity here, let me, uh, let me put an asterisk next to this. 
You guys buy that, right? The second assumption that we have is C is, is a factor of A. By definition, that means C times some integer is equal to A. <coughs> Okay. Now what we want to do is we want to plug CZ in for A in this expression, right? So I have this, so you, you see what I'm doing here? Everything is, you can follow every little step. I tell you exactly what I'm gonna do before I do it, and I have everything offset. So there's no ambiguity here at all. Not really. I mean, I'm going through it really carefully here, but I, yeah, I mean, I could type this up in two minutes. I am pro status, that's true. But, um, but, 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 that, but the thing is, I mean, you're right. When you start doing this, that's true, but that's just the this is just the laws of physics. That's just the way it is, you, you know. Give us the exam and let us practice being pro status and then come in and take the exam. Oh. <laughs> I never. Th uh, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Um, sorry, I'm not going to do that. Uh, okay. Well, luckily we're almost done though. So, yes. Uh -huh. Are they brief, or do they include extra? Uh, actually, um, the they're 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 very. I mean, they're somewhat verbose in that I I want um, I, I really want to give everybody a sense of how an argument flows in, in in English using complete sentences. So they're more so than I probably would otherwise write. Um, the main thing that I'm getting at here, though, as far as you know, writing the arguments is. Um, what you want to do is make things clear for the reader to follow and try mostly to write in complete sentences. That's really what I'm trying to get at, okay? And I'm, I'm just showing you that, um, you know, more or less, that's kind of what we're, how we're proceeding I'm through this. Uh, okay, well, that, that, it's probably not long enough. You know, like, for instance, I don't write assume. I wrote the GCD of A and B is one, or mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, 1 equals A equals BY and mm -hmm. A equals CZ. Mm -hmm. and so yeah, I know what you're saying. You're, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're, you just have a, st a streamlined version of what I have here. It's the same ideas. But what I'm. I'm scared it's too It is too terse. Okay. Yes. A pr I, I want to I be clear here. And this is not just because of me. And of course, some of you in discrete, maybe depending on who you had. In fact, I know who a lot of you had. But. Um, you, you, you're not going to trust me, but you really should trust me on this. A mathematical proof is an English argument, okay? Now, again, I can see your idea. I can know exactly where you're going to go with it. I can follow it like that. But you're, again, you're writing the proof for your grandma, who I hope she's still alive. But you're writing your proof for, the, for, your, for, the, for your grandma. That is what you're doing. So you, you, should, you shouldn't be leaving these things to the imagination. Don't, introduce, don't, don't throw out pronouns you haven't introduced. Okay, and this does take a little bit of extra time, but that is the point of a proof, is to be very clear and concise and convince the reader that you know what you're doing. Okay, I can maybe know what you're doing, but I've, I, I know all this stuff, you know. Um, but, you know, again, if you're arguing a case in court, you're not just going to say, oh, he did this at this time, and there was blood on this, and there was this, 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 and this. Okay, go and deliberate. You wouldn't do that. It would be good for the jury, but maybe. But uh, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be good for your client. So... It's the same idea, really, okay? <clears throat> okay, so what if we plug in CZ for A? Then what do we get? We get X CZ plus YB equals 1, which becomes... YB plus XZ times C equals 1. Right? Is this absolutely necessary? No. But I'm doing this just to, again for clarity. That's the reason why I'm doing it. Okay, you do not have to say, because addition is commutative, multiplication is commutative and associative. You don't have to say that. 
Okay. Just to, and again, some of this, some of this is personal taste. So I can't give you a list of exactly what you're going to have to know in order to write proofs that I'm going to like. It just doesn't exist. But when you have the main idea there and your proof is is, is reasonable, you're not going to get slashed a ton of points. You, you just aren't going to. You might lose two points maybe or something out of thirty, something like that. Um, okay. So what can we say now? How do we conclude the proof? Is the question. We want to prove that the GCD of B and C is equal to one. So what do we what do we know? Well. Yes. Okay. For X Z, you mean? B plus R C equals one, where R equals X Z. Okay. You, you can do that if you. I mean, you can you can do that if you want to. Um, but here's. Here is. Sorry. What I, what, okay, I'll, I'll maybe address that in a second, but how, how, how should we finish the proof? That's the, the question. How generally, you need to say something here. You do need to say something. Because we haven't, we haven't actually written out explicitly that the GCD of B and C is equal to 1, right? We just wrote that 1 is a linear combination of B and C. The GCD of any two integers is always a linear combination of those two integers. But just because you know that something is a linear combination of the two integers doesn't make the, the, the GCD, right? Take 4 and 8, for example, right? 2 times 4 plus 1 times 8 is 16. That's not the G it's a linear combination, but it's not the GCD of 4 and 8. But there's something special about 1, right? And this is something you should say in your argument. There's a theorem that I did for you in class that shows that, that we're actually done at this point. But you should quote that. You should say that. You guys follow me here? Just because 1's a linear combination, in general, okay, <laughs> There's something special about one, but just because the number is a linear combination of the two does not make it the GCD. Does not. The fact that it's one makes it the GCD. But there's a theorem I gave you, and I proved this. I believe it was probably theorem three. I'm good. I am good. So it's theorem three, right? Okay. Theorem three says that if the linear combination, so the theorem three says that the GCD of A and B is one if and only if one is an integer linear combination of A and B, because one is an integer linear combination of B and C. The GCD of B and C is 1 by theorem 3. That's how you finish the proof. That is how you finish the proof. Some of you give me dirty looks. Don't give me dirty looks. That's how you do it. That is how it's done. Okay? No, I'm not going to expect you to do that on the exam. Um, if that's, oh, on the homework? You can, you can say, I mean, you can say it either from, uh, you know, the theorem that I did in class. Of course, the book has different numbering. But you should make some sort of reference to that result. Well, you know, by theorem 2.3 on page blah, 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 you know. But you, you, sh you need to say something. Can I say by A theorem? Yeah, that's fine. It was shown in Yeah, that's fine. I'm not going to get that picky about it, okay? You know. But as long as you say something that you understand that there's some specific theorem that guarantees this, that it's not just true for anything, that one is special somehow. Okay. So now all you have to say is something that, like, um, Thus, GCD of BC equals 1 by theorem 3. And this is, of course, from class now. Okay, there's the proof. Okay. But you can see that it's not just a bunch of symbols like a calculus derivative here. I'm making an argument and I'm justifying things in English. That's what you guys should be trying to do. Is this okay? Okay. Um, I want to, so we're going to run out of time here, but um, I mean, I, I covered a decent amount of stuff. And certainly the definitions and the theorems, guys, you guys should be able to get these, these things without too much trouble. Um, I would strongly encourage you, those of you especially that are losing a decent number of points, especially for your exposition, uh, the solutions to every graded problem that, that um, I've passed back so far, these are all posted on the website. Some of you have looked at, the, at them now. But I've written them out very carefully, and you can see how the flow is. And you compare your solutions, you should start to get a sense, oh, crap. I mean, that will help you. If you, if you have that, that reaction, that's actually good. This takes some time. It does take time to, to construct really clear, um, you know, airtight arguments. It does take a little bit of work. Okay. 
Um, but I definitely encourage you guys to look online, look at the solutions, okay? Um, I've, I've put forth some effort to, to try to help you with this stuff. Um, I'll also tell you that um, tomorrow I will be around for a little while in the afternoon. Um, I will be around tomorrow from 2.30 to 3.30. So if you want to stop by, feel free to come by. I'm really, if I seem like a jerk in class, I'm really not. I mean, a lot of you have come by already. I mean, I'm a pretty nice guy. So, what's that? Uh, I will not have beer. I will have, uh, I'll have vodka and I'll have some dessert wine. Um, and I'll have chocolate, too. Um, no, I'm kidding. Even if you show up and you're like, wait, where's the vodka? I thought you were going to have vodka. Huh? No, there's no, there's, I can't. That would, I would get fired pretty quickly for that, I think, if anyone find out. <laughs> hey, I, I, I'm not saying I wouldn't, I, I'm not saying I would not enjoy that, but I, I can't, I can't do it. I'll tell you what, after, yeah, after the semester, after the final, we'll, we'll go, I'll, I'll buy you guys some stuff at Clyde's. How's that? How's that? Can we get that writing?